Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American. Who develops, who has the foresight and the imagination to create something called assisted living, uh, which is uh, basically a hotel for seniors? Today, I have this kid who grew up in Syracuse, Jan Berman, who's the president and CEO of Engel Berman, who we're going to tell his life story. Thank you. So you were born 1951 up in Syracuse, New York. That's right. Now, you were telling me that your father came over on the boat? Correct. Where, where did he uh, immigrate from? Russia. He came over, and what year did your dad come over? Uh, 1923. And how did he end up in Syracuse? His uh, father's uncle lived in Syracuse, and uh, when he came, uh, his father came, he went to be with a family member. Now, your father, after, then he was in the Army. Right. And when he got out of the Army, he went into the um, dress shop business, correct? Exactly. Now, so growing up in Syracuse, you were working part-time in the store. Right. And uh, you have a brother or sister? A younger brother. Younger brother. And subsequently, since Syracuse had a nice university, you decided to go to Syracuse University. Now, when you were growing up, did you ever have a, the idea that you'd be in the real estate business? or What, what, were, your, what were your aspirations? I had no idea I'd be in the real estate business, and uh, I used to work in the store, and... Uh, I probably thought growing up I was going to end up working in a dress shop the rest of my life. Now, how did you decide to become an accountant? Uh, when it was time to go to college, uh, my father pushed me to take accounting courses because the theory was if you're an accountant, you could always get a job. So, uh, in fact, I was an accounting major. And after graduating, I got a job as an accountant in Syracuse. Worked there for a year at a place called J.K. Lasser. And then I went back to Syracuse, and in one year I got an MBA, and I also passed the CPA exam. I applied to big eight accounting firms in New York City, and I now, chose to Ross. Now, now, had you ever lived in New York? I mean, you, no. know, you lived up in Syracuse. You know, you were the upstate kid, you know? You didn't know what New York City is. You didn't know what Long Island was. I mean... I just knew I didn't want to stay in Syracuse any longer. Well, it was a little too cold? It was a little too cold in the winter, a little too hot in the summer, and it... it it was kind of stifling. But, but, you know, I remember going into the Army Reserve. You know, we, we, we go to the Finger Lakes. You know, that, that was near Syracuse. You were a city boy. You were going to the country. I was that, a country exa- boy who wanted exactly to go right. to the city. It was a, it was a different <laughs> thing. So, you, you, so here's Jan Berman right now. He has his MBA and he has a CPA. He has one year from J.K. Lasser, which was a great firm. Ironically, I worked there also when I was uh, starting in public accounting. And then you moved to New York, New York City? Correct. And where do you go to work? 
I, I went to work at Touche Ross. And at this time, you go as an auditor, or? I started out in the audit department, stayed there for about a year, and then I switched to the tax department. Now, did you do anything in real estate, or what type of clients were you working on? When I went to the tax department, uh, we had a, a client called Integrated Resources, which was, I think, the Zeises family at the time. And we actually, um, when the Tax Reform Act of 76 came into being, we helped to structure their tax shelter deals. That was a great training ground. Uh, you know, it's uh, very interesting that you went over there. So now, what happens after the tax department? I spent a few years there. I uh, was married at the time. My father-in-law had some industrial buildings on Long Island. Uh, he had two partners, uh, and I ended up going to work with them, uh, helping him with his business. So let's talk about, at this time, you're what, 28, 27, and 28. Mm -hmm. Your son is born, Scott. Scott was probably um, about born or about she to be born. He was about to be born. And you go into this really small industrial business. How many, he had a couple of small buildings at that uh, time. He had probably a dozen buildings. What, what did you do in the industry? Did you like the industrial business? I, I liked it. I liked uh, the creativity of it. What happened was I joined him in the late 70s. Um, he had a brother-in-law who was a partner who we bought out a year or two later. And his remaining partner died in a ski accident in 1981. So uh, at that point, it was just he and I. And what we were doing, and it was somewhat creative, is we were buying corporate surplus properties. A lot of the larger companies were leaving Long Island to get away from unions, to get away from high taxes. So the larger the building, the less competition there was to buy it. So we would buy these buildings, and we would chop them up like sausages and make them into multiple tenanted buildings by adding loading docks and splitting up electrical services and doing whatever it would take to make independent units in the building. Now, were you doing anything besides the industrial at this time? Did you, did you venture out to the residential or the retail at that time? At that time, no. So what happens later on? Uh, you tell me, I think it was that you met the legendary Milton Cooper, uh, the, you know, Marty, you know, Marty Kimmel's partner from Kimco. And what happens one day? Well, what happened was, uh, you know, we, we built a, a very large portfolio. We were probably the largest independent owners of industrial properties on Long Island. And then, of course, uh, the late 80s came, and the market wasn't so great. And in the mid-90s, when things started to get better, people were forming REITs. Milton was the first, but the, the Rexon guys went ahead and formed a REIT. So Milton was a neighbor. I asked if I could meet with him and asked him what he thought about our forming a REIT. And he had a fellow named Saltzman over at Merrill Lynch, who he called, and he put us together. And Saltzman said, you don't want to do your own REIT, but there's a REIT from the Midwest called First Industrial that wants to come to Long Island or to the Northeast and you might be a perfect fit. So in fact we we met and through Saltzman's efforts we structured a deal where we contributed I guess about three and a half to four million feet of our industrial buildings to the REIT and uh, we became the largest OP unit holders at the time in First Industrial. Um, we didn't sell them anything that was non-industrial. We didn't sell them anything where we had an outside partner because we had some properties where we had partners. They didn't want to be involved in that. And I agreed to stay on for a period of time uh, as their senior regional director helping them to grow in the Northeast region, New Jersey and, and Long Island. At that time, you, you started buying land or looking for land in Long Island, interesting spots. And uh, what happened? You were looking for a piece of property and then you met Sydney Angle? What had happened was uh, we had had a piece of property in Mitchell Field, about 20 acres, and it was zoned for office buildings. And there's somewhat of a convoluted story, but uh, in 1982, I met Roy Cacciatore. He promised us the land. We had a signed lease in 1985. We sublet it to another organization who ultimately defaulted and gave it back. The office market was soft. I met with the town. And we came up with a plan to build affordable 55 and older housing. So we built a job called the Meadows at Mitchell Field, which was 438 units of, of golden age housing is what they called it. Golden age. What, what, for my audience, what is golden age? 55, 63? Uh, in retrospect, actually, I said 55. It was 62 at the time. People 62 and older. And uh, we got extra density. We got lower real estate taxes in exchange for which we had an agreed upon sales price for the units. So that job was selling out extremely well. And I heard about a 13-acre piece of property just up the road. 
which uh, Chase Chemical had just taken back. I went to look at the property, and uh, I structured a deal to, to buy the property from a guy named uh, Dwight Arneson. Now, my secretary said, if Dwight Arneson's nickname is Arnie, I used to babysit for him. And sure enough, it was the same person. And uh, we made a deal to buy the property. I get a call that night from a fellow named Steve Krieger, and he says to me, uh, do you know who I am? I said, no. He said, well, I work with a guy named Sidney Engel. We're competing to buy the same property. Would you meet with us? I agreed to meet, and we decided to buy the property together. And what were you going to build on this property, uh, the Golden Age Homes? I thought I would do another phase of the Golden Age Homes. Uh, Sydney thought we could get uh, someone with a certificate of need to do a nursing home. So we said, let's buy it and we'll decide what we're going to do. So we, we bought it together. Uh, we found an operator with a 280 bed uh, uh, certificate of need for a skilled nursing facility, which we built in that lease to him. And then we had remaining land available. and. Uh, I had always wanted to do a high-end assisted living place. But, you know, how do you have the creativity? I mean, you were never in the hospitality industry, which assisted living really is. You really were an industrial guy over there who had built Golden Age housing. But, you know, how do you make the decision to, to go into an area which was dire needed at this time in Long Island uh, of assisted living? I had been looking around for a place for my parents, and there was nothing that was really adequate. You know, most of the places on Long Island, people were buying old hotels, old office buildings, and they were calling them senior living or adult homes, but they were horrible. So uh, we had the idea of doing it. Uh, Steve Krieger and I got on a plane and flew around the country looking for models to basically to copy. There was a Marriott uh, in Friendship, Maryland that we loved, so we got plans, floor plans, that sort of thing, went back to our architect and we said, here, make it look like that. Uh, he laid and, a, and what was this first unit, the, the first Bristol? first Bristol was in East Meadow. It was 120 units, 148 beds. Uh, the first problem was how, you, how do you finance it, having never done it. Well, we went to the Hampstead Town IDA and we convinced them we were going to be job creators of the millennium. We do hire 100 people in each of our places and we were able to get the IDA tax benefits, which meant we could issue tax-exempt bonds. And through Roosevelt and Cross, a fellow named Paul Lamas, uh, he was able to sell the bonds to the Oppenheimer Fund. So we built the first Bristol. We filled it in four months. Easy business. So let's talk about it. You said there are 148 beds? Correct. The, what is the size of a, a room? I mean, is it a room or is it an apartment? What, what's, well, what's the configuration? A typical on? Bristol is about 110,000 feet probably 40 percent of the building is what we call common areas which would include living room, library, hair salon, bar bistro, dining room, card room, uh, movie cinema. So what we try to do is we try to create the equivalent of a four or five star hotel. We provide three meals a day, all snacks. A typical room could be anywhere from 400 feet to eight or nine hundred feet, whether it's a studio, one bedroom or two bedroom. But we really encourage people to use the entire place as their home, and their bedroom is their bedroom. So if you come into a Bristol on any given day, there are people all over the place doing recreational activities. Now, do the rooms have kitchens? They have something called a kitchenette, but we don't like really a Murphy encourage stove. it. Not even that. It's a microwave, a sink, a refrigerator, freezer, a small unit. But we give them all their meals and their snacks, so there really is not a need for them to do any cooking. And you also provide buses to, uh, to go to the, the shopping centers or to the physicians and so on? Right. We have an outing every day where they go somewhere. And, and uh, what do these people pay for this? Uh, anywhere from around $4,000 a month to eight or $9,000 a month uh, for their basic room and, and, and needs. And, 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 and you also have entertainment at night. It's, so you bring the, you bring the Concord, uh, the, the Borscht Belt, and the mountains. To Long Island. To Long Island, correct. And you have probably have same, the same co uh, comedians who were in the Borscht Belt who we should had be. Hanny Youngman last night. <laughs> no, no, <okay. laughs> we dug him up. Right. So, no, no, I was at the Friars last night, so <laughs> I, I didn't see Hanny over there. I said Irv Fields, who was 95. <laughs> so that was the first one. What happens next? Uh, then we bought a site from Fred Hicks in Westbury and did a second. And what happened was we did uh, one a year for the next five years. So how many, so you had five, six Bristols? Uh, well, uh, the event you're thinking of, we had five. Okay, you had five Bristols. 
with about 700 rooms. Right. And what happens? A Canadian company in well, Australia? I got, a, I got a call from a fellow named Bob Noonan from uh, Benchmark in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. He asked if he could come down and look at my, one of my facilities. I said, great. He came down and we, we went through the facility. He asked me to come up and see what he did and I saw it. Nice. And he said, uh, would I be willing to share the cash flows of what the places? I said, look, it's not really for sale. And he persevered a bit. So he said, I'd be shocked at how much it might be worth. So uh, I let him look at the numbers on one of the facilities. And he came back with an offer to buy them all. It was a very substantial number. And based upon that, I said, you learn from your father, from the, the dress store, if the price is enough, take it. I learned that you sell things when you can, not necessarily when you want to. So we Never hired, fall in love. Right. We hired a fellow named Mel Gamzon, who was a broker that specialized in this type of uh, properties. And we basically did an auction. We offered the properties to eight parties. And uh, I think four or five bid. Two bids were similar. But uh, there was a group of Chartwell Senior Housing out of Toronto, Canada, and a joint venture with a fund from ING Australia. And um, my son Scott actually took this fellow Robert Ezer around, and the Scott said, "Dad, this is the right guy." And sure enough, we met. We hit it off beautifully, and we decided he was going to be our guy. So we ended up selling him. But also retaining management. We kept the management. We then uh, did a sixth place, which we sold to just the fund, ING Australia, not him. Uh, still have the management. We had a non-compete, which was up in February of this year. We opened up our first. New place in March, a month later. Where is that? Uh, in uh, East Norwich, New York, Huntington Town. And uh, we hope to do, again, uh, Westchester. We have two sites right now, New Jersey one. But we hope to do a dozen in New Jersey in the next three or four years. We hope to do three or four in Westchester. And we'll probably do another five or six on Long Island. So the, the plan is in five years to do maybe 15 to 20 more places. So we'll have the, the, the Bristol will be the Hyatt of uh, senior, you know, the, the the height of senior living. Correct. Over there. But in addition, you know, you, you one of the great things about you and your, your colleagues is that you've been able to take land and get it rezoned, like what you did on the Federated site, what we talk, and the, the racetrack in West Hampton. Right. We, um, we work very well with a lot of the municipalities on Long Island. We, we personally do the rezoning ourselves. As you said, uh, a good example, uh, Federated Stores had 88 acres in a place called Eastport. And we read in the Long Island Business News that after 25 years, they were turned down again for a Macy's store. So my partner, Steve Krieger, called up the guys at, at Federated, and he got an option to buy the property. The option price was $5,000 to hold the property. That wasn't the purchase price. And uh, we had a couple of years to get the thing done. So we actually got it rezoned for 240 units of housing. We sold that to WCI communities. And that, was, uh, that wasn't golden age. That was 55 and over, right? Uh, that was, um, I guess it was age restricted, yes. And then uh, we bought a piece. We bought the West Hampton drag strip in the town of Southampton, but West Hampton. And uh, we right got next that to the police, uh, the chase the, range, the, the range, <laughs> the gun range, right, and the big tower up there, right. right. We got that zone for 189 houses. We sold that to the guys from Pulte. So, we probably bought land that entitled two or three thousand homes over the last five or six years. Everything Pulte ever built on Long Island, they bought from us. WCI bought from us. We also probably built a thousand homes. That we built in Plainview. We're building 400 houses in East Meadows. So, some we built, some we sold. Uh, depending on what, you know how busy we were at any given time. And then you decided to buy, uh, there was the Doubleday property in Garden City. Tell me a little bit about that. Uh, we actually, um, we were selling a property, and we don't typically do 1031 exchanges, but um, we called certain brokers and said, what's the best deal you have? And my friend Ted Tria said, the best deal I have is this Doubleday complex. We looked at the numbers. They looked somewhat compelling. And we structured a, a very nice deal. And the number was, I guess, low. It was Bertelsmann we were really buying it from. And lo and behold, uh, Robert Sorrentino from Bertelsmann flies to Germany, and they say, sell the property tomorrow, just take the deal. And sure enough, we bought the property. He came back, and we made a deal. So we bought the um, 501, 401, 301 uh, Franklin Avenue. Um, it was a 150,000-foot 
building, which was net leased to Bertelsmann for 10 years, 120,000 foot building that which we've rented. And 301 was a vacant six acre site, which we're gonna build probably uh, 54 condominium units. We're in the process now of getting approvals to do that. And then you decide, I don't know how you ever found Rockaway Beach. How did you end up in Rockaway Beach to build that property? Um, there was a gentleman named Baruch Mappa who had heard of us and approached us and he had uh, an acre on the on the boardwalk in Rockaway Beach at the old Curly's uh, Motel or Hotel site that George Carlin used to talk about. So we got permission to build an eight-story, 100-unit condominium building there, which was very successful. Uh, and then we bought another piece from the same gentleman, Baruch Mappa, in Long Beach, the old Brighton, which was an old-age home, which we knocked down. And there we built the Aqua. Now, the, the Aqua is like the, the premier uh, building in, in Long Beach. Tell me a little bit about that. The Aqua is a 36-unit, um, magnificent eight-story building with beautiful ocean views, and uh, it's as nice a building as you're ever going to go in. When you walk in, we have a two-story waterfall, indoor pool, outdoor pool, uh, every amenity you can think of in a, in a small 36-unit building. So it's really for someone that c can afford to live a lifestyle. Is there a it's a great lifestyle. There's a doorman, there's a concierge, there's a pool person, uh, full-time porters, terrific. And now you bought the land next door, you said. We bought the land next to the Alegria Hotel, and we hope to build another 20 units there, uh, similar kind of a building, very high-end, two on a floor. And then retail, what happened? Stop and shop? What happened over there? We bought the old Camp de Bourne in Oceanside. What was the Camp de Bourne? Uh, camp de Bourne is a famous uh, day camp on the south shore of Long Island that had been there for 60, 70, 80 years. Uh, we went to contract to buy and think we were going to do housing. The market for housing was slowing down. Um, and in our research, we found that it was zoned commercial for the entire property. Um, the seller thought it was only zoned the first 100 feet commercial. So based upon that, uh, we, we went ahead and made a deal with Stop and Shop. So uh, we just opened up a Stop and Shop there. Well, what, do you, what do you see for the future? What other de developments <coughs> do you want to... We're working on half a dozen uh, sites on Long Island to build affordable rentals. We probably have a close to 2,000 units that we're in different stages of, uh, of trying to get rezoned. Now, the big problem that they have in Long Island is how do, how do the younger people move in to Long Island to maintain a home? What have you done on that? We actually were the first ones to do next generation housing in the town of Oyster Bay. Um, Explain to me what next generation means. Um, John Venditto, who's a very bright guy, is the supervisor of the town of Oyster Bay. And so we were going to see him to do some rezoning of some properties. And he had two sons that were finishing law school. And he had the idea that when you do new jobs, you could get some bonus density in exchange for building uh, some townhouses that you would sell to people who either went to Oyster Bay uh, high schools or whose family had lived in Oyster Bay for a certain number of years and they would get it at a agreed upon price which is based upon the the uh, cost of living in the, in the area. How much could they pay for this unit? Um, when we did it in Plainview it was probably about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for a uh, a beautiful townhouse. Now, do they have the right to sell it at fair market value? Or? No, they sell it uh, with increases based upon a cost of living index. But at least it gives the person the opportunity to move into the community. Correct. And that, and that is the biggest problem that we've had in, in Long Island, and I know you've been in It's a continuing problem. It's a continuing problem. Let's talk a little bit about the family, because you have your sons in the business. You have right. two wonderful sons. Tell me about them, Scott, his brother. Scott's uh, my older son, he's 32 and married with two kids. He's Names of the kids? Island Brenty. <laughs> right. And uh, he's... And his wife's name? Is Bianca. And Scott's uh, terrific. I mean, he's a very hard worker. And actually, he started a, a separate business uh, called Paramount Realty USA. Which Scott was on my other show a couple of months ago. So. And he's got an auction business where he's doing a terrific job. Uh, He's recently had auctions in uh, in Brooklyn at One Hanson Place and in Harlem and commercial auctions. He's sold some townhouses here in Manhattan. And now your other son, who's also in your business. David's 30 in the business also. And, uh, and also David, had, David, had, David has a side business also, didn't he? David, well, first of all, David uh, he went to, to University of Miami, but then he took six months off and became a certified French chef at the French Culinary Institute. 
uh, but he also invested in a company called Metal Skin, which is a leather jewelry business, and uh, doing good. <laughs> now, he's single, right? Uh, single, but living with uh, a serious girlfriend. And you are married to? Renee. Renee, right. And Renee has children Renee also? has two sons, Elias and Miles. And what do they do? And Elias is working in a marketing company, and uh, Miles is uh, graduating this year at uh, out of Tucson, University of Arizona, Tucson. Now, you said you had a, a younger brother? Rick, yeah. And what's, what's Rick? Rick do? lives in Boca Raton, and he's the largest distributor of seafood in South Florida. And how did he get into the seafood business? Rick also became an accountant, worked at Touche Ross in Newark, New Jersey, because we couldn't be in the same firm. And uh, he rented a house in the Hamptons, and he made friends with a guy named Mike something or other. Mike was in that business and uh, one day called Rick up and said, I'd, I'd love you to work with me as my sales manager. And he said, I'm an accountant. Why don't I know about sales manager? That's what I want you to do. He tried it, liked it. And at a point in time, he moved to Florida and uh, put the kids in a, in a minivan. He learned the, took six months working for someone else, opened up his own place. And today he does all the cruise ships. He does all the restaurants and the country clubs down there. And he's got a, a huge business down there. And it's interesting that it's really nice that your two sons are working with you and, and, and really, you know, building the next generation. And now your partner's kids in the business also? Uh, well, Stephen has three daughters. The oldest is at Vanderbilt. Uh, his number two is, is going off to college in the fall uh, to uh, Bucknell, and he has a younger daughter. And then Sydney has uh, a grandson in the business, Jonathan, who's working with on the construction side of the business. And this year is a special birthday coming up, right? And Renee, Renee is planning a, a special birthday, you yeah, know. I'm going to be 60 in a few weeks. <laughs> you look pretty good for 60. So you're an old guy, huh? <laughs> no, you're not an old guy. You know, as I said a couple months ago when I did the life of uh, Victor Amali and I walked into his office, he said, do you know how I old I am? I said, you're 92. And I said, the reason you're 92 is because you go to work every day. And I think part of the reason why that you've been so successful is that you go to work and you enjoy it. I do. And, and that's, you know, and, and for the kid from Syracuse, New York, who started as an accountant, I think you've truly become a builder of New York and a New York life story. And I'm, thanks for being here today. And thank you for having me. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Ackman Ziff Real Estate Group, LLC, Bingham McCutcheon, LLP, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Friedman, LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns, and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Site Comply, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, The Wickhoff Group, Urban American.